Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David Sutphin, and um, we're here from Geeson, USA, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, this is my colleague, Katie Cates, um, and also my colleague, Isaiah. Say hi, hi Isaiah. Hello. Um, so we're happy to be here today um, hosting the webinar. Um, so we have a collaboration where um, Willem has uh, uh, pre-recorded um, a presentation um, on roasting um, defects. Um, and uh, Katie has also done, um, and she'll be doing a roasting also along with that. Um, so we're gonna get started with the webinar now and we'll go right into the presentation. We'll break about midway and um, go over the uh, roasting together. Um, and then we'll also be available for questions all through it. So we're going to go ahead and start now with the presentation. Hello, good morning. I'm Willem Boots. I'm uh, happy to join here through this recorded session of um, my presentation for this uh, Gießen webinar, Troubleshooting Roasting Profiles. And uh, I would like to um, go over some essential elements related to roasting profiles and how to deal with potential um, issues and problems and how to uh, prevent these as well. So let me share my screen here so we can review some of these major issues. And um, I hope you are all doing well in all parts of the world where you're located. So troubleshooting roasting profiles. What uh, are we specifically going to discover in this? I would like to um, review some of the terminology specific to um, profile roasting. The uh, understanding of this terminology obviously helps greatly with uh, also the prevention of uh, roasting profiles. Then I would like to go over some of the variables that can be um, uh, described when we're roasting and how we can take these variables into account to determine the roasting profile. And then uh, we will look at some general uh, techniques to uh, be able to keep track of uh, heat application, sensory milestones, and uh, those types of information that is relevant when you're preparing roasting profiles. And then uh, I would like to go over some examples of roast profiling issues and defects. And then we will have some closing comments before uh, David and Katie will uh, take it over. So first to be all on the same page, what, what is a profile? I would um, think, you know, a profile is all about how a coffee is roasted during a certain time um, while the coffee bean travels in bean temperature from a relatively cold uh, state to a uh, bean that is roasted anywhere between 350 to 400 plus degrees fahrenheit so it's really uh, a description of how this coffee is roasted um, but when we specifically look at you know, roasting profiles, to do roast profiling consistently, it can help us um, uh, improve overall the consistency of our flavor profiles. So roasting profiles are very much connected with uh, the profiles um, of the coffees in the cup. There are also, and specifically the record keeping related to the roasting profiles, um, it's an important tool for quality control to be able to tell that uh, your batch A11 of a given coffee 
and A12 and A13 and A14, as long as they have been roasted consistently with a certain profile, we can then also uh, be more certain that this coffee will be uh, in quality, in sensory quality, um, the same. Roasting profiles and the practices around profiles and executing them help you greatly as a continuing learning tool. And I would think, you know, with all the types of um, uh, uh, techniques around to record profiles, to keep track of how these profiles were done, they are also um, an excellent uh, tool to share information. For example, if I roast um, my, my preferred coffee with the uh, Gießen profiler, then I can literally show not only this profile with all its specific milestones to my colleagues, but I can also send this profile to my colleagues for them to learn from that. And then um, when we implement, execute roasting profiles um, consistently, then they're also a great efficiency tool. Um, it helps us to um, minimize product that um, has to be discarded. It helps us maintain shrinkage levels. And obviously for that reason also, uh, profitability is a major reason why you want to be serious about your roasting profiles. Um, I would specifically say that if you have a award-winning roasting profile, or if you have just a successful roasting profile for your preferred espresso blend, then this can set you apart from the competition and it just helps drive up your profitability. And then last but not least, um, the right roasting profile for the right coffee helps you to um, get a better quality of that coffee uh, in the cup. And um, it's a great quality improvement tool as well. So we always um, talk about the plant profile versus the actual profile. So um, we obviously plan our profiles, but then when once the roast master, once she or he is making the um, profile, um, there has to be a specific decision made to hit certain temperature points, certain beam temperature points that depends on the coffee type, on the desired outcome. And um, so the interaction of the roast master is really important with the profile, needless to say. And um, ultimately it's the flavor of the coffee, the flavor profile of the coffee that should be the decision maker for um, the profile, whether or not it's an awkward profile um, statistically uh, if we're looking at the curve uh, or when it's um, done successfully, then the profile can also be measured against the example curve that was established. Now, so if we look at an example profile curve, you know, this is a profile curve as um, uh, our clients might produce these. Not all curves are perfect, more about this later, but typically in a profile curve through the red line, we see represented the um, environmental temperature, the air temperature, the blue line, the blue curve is the bean temperature. And then the somewhat jagged, awkward looking curve is the rate of rise curve. So this is a good example of a, um, profile curve as we can uh, reproduce these through the Gießen profiler or through Cropster or through Artisan or whatever type of logging tool you might be using. Now, what can we do to prepare ourselves before roasting? And being prepared well also helps us to make sure that uh, we are going to prevent any issues and any problems. So let's look at some of these um, uh, considerations 
Now, first, um, we have to be we have to have a, a good idea of what the room temperature is. So the room temperature where the roasting machine is located. Um, if you're in summer in Indiana or in winter in Seattle or in spring in San Francisco, that makes a huge difference in terms of room temperature um, and potentially for the ambient temperature, temperature that becomes the inlet air for the roasting machine. And it's not just the room temperature, but it's also the relative humidity. What does the temperature do? Obviously, the beans are stored in often in the same room or close to the room where roasting is taking place. And it is fair to assume that in specific seasons of the year, the temperatures in these rooms, unless you are fully climate controlled, it is reasonable to assume that the temperatures in these rooms can be different over the different seasons in the year. The relative humidity can be a huge um, influencing factor. A higher relative humidity uh, in the air will drive up potentially the moisture in the bean, which will have obviously consequences for the roasting process. The humidity, as well as the temperature of the coffee bean, they will affect the heat transfer inside the bean. And another consideration is which batch of the day are you roasting at that point? The first batch versus the second batch versus the tenth batch um, indicates a different heat stability that the machine will have. And that will also um, help us understand what the latent heat energy is stored inside the roasting machine. As you know, uh, roasting machines can be extremely heavy, made of heavy materials. So the, the batch of the day really influences also whether or not the profile will come out as intended. Typically, um, after the second batch, the roasting machine becomes more heat stable and will produce more consistent profiles. There's certain, to get prepared, there are certain green coffee measurements you want to do. Uh, this can be on bean size. Um, that, that definitely can have an impact on how the profile evolves. You will do an inspection of the level of defects, the physical defects in your coffee. For sure, you will want to get a clear idea of what the moisture content is of your coffee. And if you don't have a moisture analyzer, then um, there are other ways. Um, these are not exact, but sensory ways to get a, a clue of what the moisture in your bean might be. There are tools to measure the water activity. Water activity is basically how the water is contained within the cellular content of the bean and water activity also helps us make predictions about the stability of that coffee over time. And then last but not least, there is the color of the beans. Usually when beans um, age, they gradually lose their color from a um, green or bluish green down to a more um, hay, brownish green towards a um, almost cinnamon color, uh, which will occur when beans are really stored too long over time. So these measurements help us determine um, how to be best prepared for the roasting job at hand. And then of course, post roasting, we want to select the right cupping form. Here we are looking at the uh, SCA cupping form. At Boot Coffee, we are working with a, a very distinct cupping form. And you and your companies, um, if you're not using a form currently, then I really recommend that you're using a form. It can be a simplified cupping form to evaluate your roasting performance. But using forms really helps you keep track of um, what has been going on with the roasting performance of your machine.
during roasting, what can we do during roasting in order to make observations on the um, profile itself? Obviously, uh, the charge temperature, the temperature at which the coffee is introduced into the roasting chamber um, will set the pace for the roasting process itself, for the roasting profile itself. Charge temperature in our campus, we typically um, express this in air temperature. So we preheat the machine. And if we charge the beans, let's say at 350 degrees, then this is 350 degrees as indicated by the air temperature uh, probe, the air temperature thermocouple of the roasting machine. Then obviously we are making uh, observations of the bean temperature, um, of the rate of temperature change, the rate of rise. And if your machine has a separate um, thermocouple, usually with bigger roasting systems of the exhaust temperature that can be helpful. Um, with smaller machines, the exhaust temperature is the same as the air temperature. Um, like with the Gissen, the air temperature probe is actually an exhaust temperature probe because it's located right in the hot air return pipe. Uh, David and uh, Katie uh, can um, go over that in their explanation. And then we want to have an idea of the heat application. That's the um, burner setting. Um, Gissen uses the um, term power. The power that the burner produces is a uh, measure of indication for the heat application. Then the turn around point helps us determine at which point the beans start absorbing heat. This is basically um, the point at which the roasting profile really starts. And then the specific changes of the beans during roasting, the color changes, the yellowing of the bean, indicative for the start of the uh, Maillard reactions that uh, follows upon uh, the drying of the beans having fully started. Then when the beans start to more towards a cinnamon color, which is indicative for the uh, um, caramelization within the beans, the sugars changing in uh, chemistry. And then we want to keep track of the first crack. If we are roasting um, as far as uh, the second crack, we want to keep track of this. And then we want to really notice the gas and airflow control changes. For those of you who actually use the Gießen roasting system, um, we have with the Gießen, we have this awesome uh, air pressure uh, profiling option through the setting of the airflow in the machine, the air pressure in the machine, with, which helps us uh, basically create unique profiles by itself. Now, here's some of the observations we can make. Um, in this case, we are expressing in uh, the, on the vertical scale, the temperature in Fahrenheit, where on the vertical scale, it's from zero, in this case, to 400. The, in the example curve that you're looking at, the charge temperature is at 290 degrees air temperature. Then the bean temperature curve starts to build and upon the introduction of the coffee into the system um, we then see the bean temperature curve showing a decline in temperature um, but then there's a turnaround point where the beans really start absorbing heat the first color changes to yellow in this example curve at 265 degrees fahrenheit and then the cinnamon color change um, indicative for the uh, caramelization of the sugars, um, in this case at 330 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the observations we can make, uh, the first crack um, at 380 degrees Fahrenheit, the second crack at a later stage. Now, these temperatures, obviously you have to take these temperatures with a little bit of a grain of salt because the uh, temperatures are also machine specific. 
Um, in our lab, we have a W6 um, that indicates the first crack at a different temperature than the W1A. So I don't see this as a big deal. Typically, from brand to brand and from model to model, the temperatures indicated by your roasting system might be different. And it's really mostly a matter of building up your consistency with the specific machine you're using over time. So what observations during the roast can we make? Um, we of course have the rate of rise as well, and that's the speed of the roast in any given time of the roast. And that rate of rise is also related to the slope of the time temperature curve at any time. So the rate of rise is really typically expressed in the bean temperature increase per 30 seconds. And again, these measurements as displayed in these curves can change from roaster to roaster. They can also be very specific to the uh, sea level or the elevation at which you're roasting. If you're roasting at sea level, then your machine will behave differently from when you're roasting at, uh, let's say, 2,000 feet. Here's an example of a roasting profile of um, the coffee from my own farm, La Mula, where we like to take this coffee first at a kind of a heat soak uh, at a 10% burner setting. And then be beyond the turning point, we go into um, a 70% uh, burner setting and then gradually reducing down to 35% and then to 20%. Okay, so we're gonna pause for a moment and then show you guys our roast profile that we did so that you can see uh, an example of what Willem's been discussing and then we'll go back to Willem's explanation. Okay, hi guys, Katie here. I am going to be roasting for you guys. Uh, I have a new Ethiopia, a new to me Ethiopia. This is a natural uh, Sadamo Guji. Um, when I am first starting with a coffee that I am not fully familiar with, I will generally roast a small batch to start. Um, so in this case, what I'm gonna do is preheat my roaster. Um, I generally preheat to about 410, 420, somewhere in there and let the roaster get good and hot. Uh, if I am doing a very small batch uh, or if I have a very delicate coffee, that'll be my first batch of the day. In our case, our roaster is already good and hot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name my profile. I'm going to get us ready to record. I'm just doing a small batch. Um, so in this case, if I don't know the coffee and I'm going to start with a small batch, we generally will use it for cold brew. Cold brew is pretty forgiving, so I will use my first batch as kind of a trial run to understand the coffee a bit better and just to know um, a little bit more about how it accepts the heat and also what kind of taste we can get from a coffee um, and then adjust from there. So after I've preheated the roaster, I generally have it set to auto while it's preheating just before I'm ready to go. On a softer bean like this, this does look like it is a more open coffee. So I will turn my burner to off and I'm gonna leave my, my setting, my air setting at 410. Um, I usually use my air setting or set point as kind of a leash to prevent me from getting too hot as we roast. Um, I can adjust it as I need to, but I generally like that there just as a precautionary um, measure. So I will turn my burner to off and I will keep an eye on my air temperatures. Generally with an Ethiopia um, or coffee I'm not familiar with, I'll start around 384 on the air temp. Um, so I'm just gonna wait for that to drop back down. And when we get there, start my roast. Okay, so on a coffee I don't know, I will generally not apply any heat, unless I'm doing a large batch for some reason. Um, in this case, since I'm just doing six pounds, I'm gonna leave the heat off 
and I'm just going to let it coast down and just to see how the coffee absorbs the heat. Um, generally with an Ethiopia, especially one that has uh, sweeter taste notes, this one has strawberry and jam as its taste notes from the importer. So I want to make sure that we save the, the sweeter notes, and especially since we're going to do cold brew, I think it's going to really, really pop that way. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to let it ride, see how it's doing. And the turning point on our roaster is generally right around just under a minute. So we should see that here pretty quick. And then I'm gonna start keeping an eye on my rate of rise. We'll see that start to climb. And I'm generally looking to get to about 20, 25 on my rate of rise during that first minute and a half to two minutes. If it looks like I'm not quite gonna get there, it looks like it's lagging, maybe I don't have enough heat in my drum, I will apply some heat. Or if I'm doing a larger batch, in this case, it looks like I might not get there in the time that I want. So I'm gonna put 10% on the burner. Just want to make sure that our rate of rise is good and high so that we can kind of gently de uh, decrease that as we go. We don't want anything too steep in the beginning. We also don't want anything that's too low so then you end up with that flat line baking. Generally, I found with uh, Ethiopian coffees, they do accept heat pretty well in the very beginning, but then you'll notice a little bit of a lull in the middle, and it's really tempting to apply a ton of heat to keep that momentum going. Um, if you just wait a little bit, it will start to absorb the heat, and it, the curve will look more correct to what you're used to on other coffees. So I try not to react too aggressively or too uh, reactive. And I don't want it to stall out, so I'm not going to leave it at 10%. I'm going to bump us up to about 35. Just to keep our momentum going, but not to go too heavy. I don't want my roast to be too quick, but I also don't want it to stall out. So for me, the Geeson software um, has been extremely helpful in understanding uh, the changes that I'm making and how it directly and very quickly affects the coffee that I'm roasting. Um, in the very beginning, I used to chart everything by hand. I think that's incredibly good practice for someone that's new. Uh, it helps you to pay attention, helps you to keep your focus on what you're doing. But I kind of feel that long term, especially when you're roasting for production or you're roasting for a specific type of uh, flavor notes, it's a little harder to um, to replicate those same adjustments because you have to check your paper, you have to check your notes, you have to check your graph that you have to make after the fact. Having this decent profiler um, kind of just makes everything like right there in front of you. You have all of your adjustments right in front of you. You can see what you've done, especially if you're using your profile as a reference point. So uh, I really, really enjoy the profiler in terms of giving me like just a much, much more accurate view of our roast. Okay, so to me, I think our profile curve is looking really well. Um, I think it's not too steep looking. Um, we're about four and a half minutes in. Our color is definitely already changing to a nice yellow. Um, this coffee has a very fruity smell, even just being in the bag. So the smell right now it has kind of a, a bread note to it, but it definitely still has kind of almost like a, I'd say like an apricot smell to it. Okay, 
so on most ethiopians in my experience you do have kind of a sharper decline on the rate of rise usually about this point like it turns yellow it's it's definitely absorbing the heat it just always seems to kind of almost stall in the middle i always just let it ride especially for the first roast i don't want to get too crazy and make it something that's hard to replicate later or make a profile that's very complicated especially if i'm going to be using it as a reference later i just want to have something that gives me a general baseline of what we're doing something that's on average just something that could work across the board for any coffee but also in this case just give me a nice clean slate to work from and we are starting to just start to brown a little bit coming out of the bright yellow lemony color Still have some nice fruit notes, but it's definitely getting a little bit more like a baking bread. So in this case, I have already reached my set point leash, which I don't necessarily want this early on. So see how we're starting to tank? I will raise that up a little bit more, and then I might also just bump up my air. Um, allowing the hot air to kind of coast means that I don't have to apply more burner, um, but I can still definitely kind of recoup that little dip that we're seeing there without applying more direct heat from the, the drum. Depending on our timing and our color and our smells, generally around the 365 degree range, somewhere in there, and it's generally right around 8 minutes, um, I will drop my burner back down, which the roast is already doing for me since we're still approaching our set point. So I'm just going to let it ride. Just going to let it see what it does. Okay, and we're getting into our cinnamon color. Kind of like a sweet bread. Okay, so from here I do want to get to my first crack at a time that makes sense. So I'm going to bump this up pretty significantly and just kind of push us there. And for first crack, I know a lot of people go off of the, the sound, especially when it starts to pop. With the geese in as well insulated as it is, and also just with your fan motors and such, it is a little hard to hear. I will generally use my sense of smell to tell me if we are getting close. Um, so I, right around 380, I'll start pulling some samples and smelling. It makes a very, very, very distinct and drastic smell change. Uh, on my roaster, it's about 383 degrees Fahrenheit, so around 380 I will start to check, especially with the coffee I don't know. Sometimes it's sooner, sometimes it's a bit later, but that gives me like a good indicator, uh, just kind of a reminder to start checking. And I can hear some popping. I can see them popping a little bit in my sample there. And there's our smell change. It's very, very distinct. On this coffee, it's kind of like a black tea, like a very freshly brewed, freshly poured black tea. We have a Costa Rica that we do that sometimes it smells exactly like a green bell pepper. So I'll mark my first crack. I think I want to go about a minute after first crack. Um, usually if I don't know the coffee, I'll aim for between 12 and 16 percent, just kind of as a, it gives me a number to aim for, um, as a lot of it's just like the color and the smell. I don't want to go too dark, especially with a coffee I don't know, 
especially with something that's supposed to have these really nice sweet fruity notes. So I'll just keep checking my color, keeping an eye on my development, keeping an eye on my rate of rise. I do know that with some Ethiopias, um, they tend to crash right around first crack. So I'm going to keep my air up high like it is, um, since the roaster is adjusting my burner for me. Um, I'm just going to let it kind of coast that way, keep my rate of rise low, but not letting it crash. And if it does look like it's going to crash, I'll raise up my leash uh, to allow my burner to come back on. Okay, so we're right about 10%. Things are looking really good. Still smelling really good. So we're right about a, almost a minute and a half, so I think we're going to call it good there. We'll be probably right about 14%. So I'm just going to start my cooling fan and drop it. So this is a lighter roast, and like I said, with this particular coffee, not knowing how it's going to accept the heat, uh, I didn't want to go too dark with it, and we can definitely feel from this profile uh, taking any direction that we want to go. Now that we have been um, setting the stage for this discussion. So here again, the little bit awkward looking profile curve. Why do I say awkward? Because look at this rate of rise. Uh, the rate of rise peaks in this case um, at uh, around 11 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 seconds. But then you see that the uh, rate of rise gradually comes down um, and then it goes up again. Wow, this would be enough reason to give some of the self-proclaimed roasting gurus of this world a little bit of a, a shock um, because here we have, here we are actually looking at a flick and a crash. You can see right upon the onset of the first crack, we see in this example of a roast profile issue, we see that the um, rate of rise increases when the heat becomes exothermic and then that's the flick and then it crashes when it comes down. Now, obviously this can have consequences for your flavor profile, but not necessarily so. In my opinion, these flicks and crashes can be um, relatively normal depending on how you are used to control the gas in your roasting machine. From a chemistry perspective, it can definitely have an impact, but in the end, it's really about the flavor profile that counts. But in general, it's better to try to prevent these flicks and crashes. Why? Because for repeatability sake, for consistency sake, it will be hard to reproduce these always at the same time and um, temperature. Here we are looking at a um, PDF output of a, a Gissen profile from the Gissen profiler. And here we also see um, not only once a flick and a crash, but we see this twice actually. So this is a profile from a coffee actually that I roasted not too long ago. Um, this was done after some trials were made. And in one of the trials, obviously, things didn't go perfectly. Um, you can see the green line in this picture, indicative for the um, heat output, the burner output. And the burner output was, for some reason, it was reduced way too early. And then we had to recover the roasting profile. And you can see that's that, that bump in the rate of rise curve, which is in yellow. Now that recovery, which followed on the flick and crash was really done to try to um, finish this roast in the time frame that we had planned to do. So you could think, wow, this coffee cannot 
taste any good. Now, interestingly, when we cupped different profiles blind, this was actually one of the best flavor profiles. So this is a great example where in theory, we might have had, because of this roller coaster flick crashing recovery, where we might have had not a very good profile um, flavor wise, we actually found the, um, the, re the reverse. We found that this profile was better than even the more standard profiles that we would be doing with this coffee. And so this is a good example where your assessment in the cup does not always uh, confer, validate your assessment on the roasting profile. But again, this type of roller coaster curve, which um, you all must have had at some point, um, uh, is hard to reproduce for consistency's sake. It's better to um, prevent them. And here we see a profile where the roast was kind of gradually dwindling down. We picked this profile and then gradually the rate of rise came down. We had a minor flick and crash towards the end, uh, towards the end of the first crack. And then this roast was finished at 12 minutes. In this case, the coffee was almost baking. And when um, coffee, uh, coffee starts baking during a roasting profile, you lose acidity. So you're getting kind of a, um, a flabby acidity that is um, not indicative anymore for what that acidity could have been if it was would have been roasted with a um, steeper um, slope coming down on the rate of rise. So when we are looking at um, specific roasting defects, then we can really use well the flavor wheel. And this is actually the old flavor wheel that the um, SCAA at that time, the Specialty Coffee Association of America had been developing. And that flavor wheel actually also has a uh, section for aroma taints and taste faults as a result of roasting, as a result of improper roasting. And so here we are looking at the first example of a scorched coffee bean. So scorched coffee beans can create all kinds of flavor um, uh, issues, flavor defects. Like with this bean, we see in the middle, around the center cut, we see these hot points caused, usually caused by um, very hot areas on the roasting drum or on the veins that allow the beans to uh, be rotated through the drum. And that can create um, uh, a slightly charred, a slightly um, uh, over roasted, kind of a drying sensation in the body on the coffee. So scorched beans should be prevented at all time. It's often indicative also for the burners of the roasting machine not being calibrated well. This is a serious scorched bean, and this can um, come with all kinds of flavor issues, anywhere between uh, cooked, charred, and then having producing all kinds of strange flavors as a result of the um, chemistry of the beans changing. This is an extreme example. Obviously, it's caused by basically roasting a bean that is in terms of its density, in terms of its hardness, not built up, not prepared for the heat produced by the roasting machine. A tipped bean typically happens um, as a result of the beans being pushed more towards the outer walls of the roasting drum. And that can also create specific flavors like cereal-like, um, also a drying, astringent, biscuity, sometimes even skunky type of uh, aftertaste in the coffee. So tipped beans should be prevented at all times also. And you know, it can be indicative for the fact that the uh, roasting drum is rotating too fast. So you might want to um, 
see if you can do, turn down the RPMs of your drum. A chipped bean. This can be caused by um, usually by quality issues of the green bean before it gets into your hands. The bean might have a minor crack or chipped beans can also develop as a result of too much heat in the first stage of the roasting. As a result of that, the bean starts expanding too fast and it will pop out this chip out of its um, bean structure. The area under that chip typically then um, starts to become charred, resulting in all kinds of uh, flavor issues and defects. And this is um, a cross cut of a baked bean, a bean that has been um, roasted too long at a um, rate of rice that is close to zero. This is an extreme case here. It also leads to just flavor loss. Typically, baked coffee beans have a lack of flavor. They taste empty. If you're ever interested to come to one of our courses at Boot Coffee Campus, to um, learn about all these flavor defects in roasting um, at our intermediate roasting course, SCA course, certified SCA course, there is actually a very practical tasting set of tasting exercises with these types of um, uh, roasting defects. And then um, some other examples for beans that uh, kind of provides an indicative sign that roasting issues are around the corner, like this bean uh, showing uneven moisture evaporation in the first stage, indicative for too much heat being used during the first phase of roasting. Um, this is also very similar. Initial temperature was too high. As a result of that, the beans are expanding too quickly, softer beans are normally not really prepared for very high temperatures in, in, in excess of 350 degrees air temperature upon charging. And this is a serious case of internal scorching. So here, um, this can be the result of that first picture with the uneven uh, moisture evaporation that can result into um, moisture leaving the cellular structure throughout the beans in an inconsistent manner, producing the result that one part of the bean was roasted more and another part of the beans was roasted less, resulting in this scorching, which creates flavor issues and defects. The remedy here is to use a lower charge temperature. And some other examples of a um, bean roasted in different stages. On the left, uh, we have a bean at a actual color of between 55 to 57. Um, then if we develop that bean too much with a development percentage in excess of 20%, the bean can, um, yeah, because of the fact that it's in this case, close to baking, the bean loses its acidity and its aromatic properties. And then if we continue that, this specific bean could be over roasted or burnt in the later stages of the roast. These are all um, possibly undesirable outcomes of the roasting process. And then uh, last but not least, I want to make some comments on some chemistry changes during roasting and how these can also negatively affect the end result, the flavor profile. Um, so as I discussed, during roasting, we have the Maillard reactions and then followed by the carbonization reactions. So it's really important to know with your machine um, during which temperature ranges, bean temperature ranges, these reactions occur. The Maillard reactions um, are very distinct and very different from the caramelization of the sugars. If I um, have prolonged Maillard reactions, meaning 
the phase between 250 to 320 degrees Fahrenheit, if I take too long for this, more than um, seven to nine minutes, then this can lead to a very distinct bitterness in the coffee. And if I take, if I'm taking my caramelization too fast, so if the temperature at the point of caramelization, 320 degrees Fahrenheit, is too high, then we will um, shoot through this point too fast, resulting often also in a development which is short, resulting in um, sour flavors potentially, or a lack of sweetness altogether. And then again, referring to that old flavor wheel, which I like quite a bit actually, there's a section um, that describes the dry distillation like flavors. And these flavors can be produced by over roasting the coffee with too much heat to a bean temperature that's too high. And basically what is this dry distillation? It's a process where the solids the bean fibers are heated uh, and the oils are heated and turned into gases too quickly at temperatures that is too high, which can also result into um, this, this process called pyrolysis, where you're basically losing the roast because things are getting out of control altogether. And then um, during roasting, we of course see major structural changes these are um, driving, these structural changes are also coming concurrent with the chemistry changes. During roasting, we can change, we can lose 13 to 22% of the mass. And being able to keep consistency in your roasting profiles also helps you to, um, yeah, to prevent inconsistencies in this process of mass loss and shrinkage, and which can have major, major influence on the outcome of the, not only the looks of the beans, but also on the um, density of the coffee beans. And specifically in roasting, um, from a chemistry perspective, what we're very concerned about is the, are the organic acids. And these are specifically the citric and malic acids that normally always break down during roasting but doing the roasting consistently helps you to maintain this within uh, specific levels and these organic acids are very uh, essential very important for ultimately the flavor profile of the coffee and that was um, that these were my comments so far thank you very much i um uh, wish you a great day and a great continuation of this webinar with uh, David and Katie, my um, dear colleagues and friends from uh, Gießen, USA, and they will do a um, uh, live roasting session with you, I believe, and have fun. Good luck. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. You can always reach us at bootcoffee.com. Also, for the latest offerings of uh, roasting courses and related courses that can help you um, improve your flavor profiles and your roasting profiles. Enjoy, bye-bye. Okay. So, hey everyone, uh, we hope you enjoyed that. And um, we, we really appreciate Willem putting that um, together um, and Katie for her efforts. And uh, Willem, we wish you safe travels. Um, we were uh, hoping to um, just be available if anyone has any, any questions or if anyone wanted to add anything um, into the chat. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're more than welcome to help you um, with that. Um, I did want to just take a minute and point out like one or two mechanical things on the roaster. So, um, if you see behind us the W15, um, we that's the machine that we use to record the the roast. 
Um, and I was going to just put Katie on the spot for a second and see if she can point out um, where we take the temperature readings on the machine, just in case you're not uh, familiar with where, where we take those readings at. Yeah, so your beam temperature is always, your beam temperature is always located in your jump door. Uh, that is where your beam reading is on your screen. Uh, the air temperature that we'll have mentioned is actually located behind your hopper here. It's actually in that air return that completes the back that um and so yeah i i um the one of the things that we really love about the geese is the the profiler um if you if you do not have that I, I really strongly recommend getting it um it's especially helpful if you're trying to do a profile where you have for example an espresso roast that you want to uh reproduce that so you're getting the same results um it's it's very helpful um Katie, would you have anything to, to add with maybe why you chose to do that profile for that type of coffee? Um, no, that's generally what I would do for any coffee uh, that I don't know, uh, just a small batch and kind of experimenting to see how quickly it will progress with the smaller amounts of heat. And that'll tell me what I can and can't do with it as we scale up. Um, we're able to do 15 kilos total in our roasters. So uh, you don't have to go through so much coffee to kind of dial it in using the profiler. And then once you have a profile saved, you can use it as a reference point. So when you add more coffee in, or you want to make adjustments with your, your drum speed, your air set points, um, you do all that overlaying on your reference profile, uh, and then just kind of scale up your profiles to different batch sizes, different uh, roast degrees, like they were saying for espresso versus drip. Um, but it can all stem off that initial first smaller batch profile that you saved. Um, so if you take a look um, in the background, we have um, our little white uh, sample roaster, and um, that also can run the, the Geeson profile software. And um, I, Katie, I just wonder if you have anything like to say about um, how profiles might scale up from the sample roaster to the big machine, if, if anyone's working with that. Yeah, they, they don't scale up automatically. Uh, it, it's similar to what I did with our 15 kilo, um, where it's just a smaller batch size. And you can use the same general like curve shape and your rate of rise. And as long as you are competent with your larger machine and you know how the bean reacts to the heat, um, you can use the profile that you've gotten from your sample roaster on a larger roaster, uh, but you would manually be roasting to scale up that batch size. So you can use it that way as well. We've done that in the past. Um, usually when we get a new coffee in, things move in so quickly, I don't always do the sample roast first. I just kind of throw it in the big guy and start with a smaller batch size and build a profile from there. Um, so another question I had, Katie, like um, anything, like in, in Pittsburgh, we have very, um, humid, hot weather in the summer and then in the winter, it can be very, very cold. Um, is there anything to consider with the profiles as far as being able to keep them stable in a, a warehouse where you don't have the best climate control? Yes. So all of the profiles that we have, um, we usually have like a, a summer and a winter version. So when we build a profile and you've adjusted it and you've refined it and you've saved it, Generally, when we get to winter and the temperatures start changing, um, I'll use I'll start using my profiles as a reference, and then you have to manually roast to make sure you're staying on curve, keeping your rate of rise the same, uh, and then you save that, and that's now your winter profile. And it's always evolving. Um, when we use those winter profiles and we start getting into our more humid temperatures, um, I'll adjust it going the other way. Uh, you're just using it as a reference point, and you just manually adjust your roasting uh, to continue that same curve and rate of rise. So is there any like general rule of thumb, like if it's really humid, you react one way, or if it's really freezing cold, you react another way? Not like necessarily. The, yeah. I think I think there's a lot of variables depending on elevation, uh, the type of coffee you're using, how you're storing your coffee, um, your gas pressure, your gas composition. There's a lot of variables there. Um, so I think just understanding how your roaster works, um, how, it, how the coffee reacts yeah. to what you're doing with the roaster, um, you just kind of have to know how to use your machine and um, Kind of how to follow what the bean wants to do so that all that stuff is super super helpful and i think that we're all learning all the time like as we um, work with these machines um the geeson has been a very nice machine to to work with and to roast on um and so thankful for the people that make them and the people that have designed the software 
Um, and we just want to thank everyone for spending the time. And uh, thanks, Katie, for your help. And we thank you, Willem, um, again. Uh, and hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks, guys. <laughs>